Hi students, I'm Rosanna Simeon Ferguson, and I'm sorry I've been a little missing in action in the breath race stay at home workshop. But I really wanted to record a brief lecture on the history of phylogenetic comparative methods and then jump into specifically what is my field um, or where my field is going. And for that, I have a small um, breath race tutorial that is on my website. And I'll describe a little bit more when we reach there, but before that, I actually wanted to, to discuss some of the key history and how this is different from what you've been doing reconstructing fish. So let me share my, let's see there, it should be coming up. There you go, there we go. So, my field is a field of phylogenetic comparative methods, and a lot of people just um, abbreviate this word by PCMs, right? And the field really started with a very influential paper by Dr. Joe Felsenstein, that is um, in 1985, where he introduced uh, what we know now as independent contrast. Contrast, if I can spell it. Okay, so independent contrast uh, is a method that allows us to overcome the issue of lack of independence in the sample. So phylogenetic trees, the tips of the tree, are actually not an independent sample, right? Because they have a shared evolutionary history. So the brilliance of this paper was showing us a quantitative and clear way on how to overcome the lack of independence by creating a new variable, like independent contrast, that actually uh, we can compare, like independent sample, like any book in a second. This paper is so clear and so good that I highly recommend that you read it. It should be part of your basic literature in evolutionary history or, or in any evolutionary uh, method. And it's so important and so influential that today, you know, almost 30 years later, yeah, almost 30 years later, uh, we still use independent contrast. You can just go, um, to Google Scholar and put independent contrast 2020, and I bet you hundreds of papers will see it here. Uh, the next important event was a series of papers and even a, a book by Harvey Pagel uh, that started talking about the comparative, the comparative method. Uh, so Harry Pagel and colleagues introduced PGLS, that is uh, the phylogenetic generalized list of squares. So it is the official methodology on how to do linear regressions when your samples are not independent because they are tips on a tree. And they argue really strongly that this is the way to, to go about um, doing regressions across the species when you're measuring things of a species. And they argue so much in favor of it that when Mark Westerby, and I'll put it here, Westerby, um, published a paper a few years later saying not everything should be phylogenetic. He, Mark Westerby was an ecologist. Uh, they argued that ecologists really didn't understand um, what it, it was to deal with a lack of independence from a phylogenetic tree, from traits that come from a phylogenetic tree. And I will also recommend this paper, and just to just so you know, I make a list of these papers for you. Uh, but it was years later, uh, in 2019, that one of my colleagues, Joseph Weta, really uh, nailed down this discussion to think about um, comparative methods in a broader way. And I won't discuss too much about this, um, but really the, the big argument here is that every time you choose a comparative method, um, and especially a linear model, 
you are assuming some causal or, or some causality in the way variables uh, are linked. Um, so this is uh, what Joseph Huera, uh, 2019, and the paper, sorry, 2018. And the paper is Rethinking uh, Comparative Methods. So just so you know, not everything should use a phylogenetic correct. And I'm happy to discuss that um, in another in another uh, time. Anyways, so this all these discussions here pretty much assume that our trait of interest is continuous. Although Pagel um, has some correlations for discrete traits. And a trait that is continuous across across traits could be body size or peak length or genome size, which that's one of my favorites. And um, we can think of a myriad of possibilities of traits that we can measure all across or, or a species in the tips of that tree. However, there are other traits in nature that are discrete, right? So I work a lot with chromosome number, and that's one that is absolutely discrete. There's no question. There's five chromosomes or 20 chromosomes or 15 chromosomes. There's nothing like 5.1. But there's all other traits that are sort of discretizable, right? For example, we can talk about big size on birds, and we could say large or small. And maybe the precise trait is uh, 5.1 millimeters, but um, we can always find a way to discrete us. So I'm going to make a little diagram here. And we can think then about traits, uh, two different types of traits, right? Here. I'm going to put here another one. So we have continuous. and discrete. And the methods uh, for continuous that have been developed in comparative models pretty much assume um, two key models. And those two key models are Brownian motion that assumes that the trait can evolve with a mean mean, mu, and a variance, uh, I'm gonna write it here, variance, that is the, determined um, by a parameter sigma square, but also determined by branch line. And so the more time it passes by, this trait will evolve to have a broader interval. Right, so if you have a very long branch, that means in, if you're measuring body size, what you can expect is that body, the original body size at the root, right, will be really small or, or could, could be at the end of that 100 million years of evolution, anywhere between, you know, zero and um, 50 kilograms or something like that. The other model uh, that is very widely used here is uh, Orstein, Orstein. Oh, I spelled it wrong. Bulenbeck. And this, this model has actually three um, parameters. Alpha, that we sometimes refer as the, the the strength of selection, which is actually nothing about the selection you understand from microevolutionary processes. Actually, it's not selection at all. Um, also open for discussion later, the mean and the variance. And 
except that in this model, what you're assuming is that every time a trade evolves far away from, from the mean, it has a little leash. People like to compare this to a, like a dog process, where the trade can only wander so much far away from the mean, and it will come back to, it will always come back uh, to the mean eventually. And that's what an OU usually is determined, denominated by OU. Um, and this is where the OU process comes from. So Brownian motion starts also in the 90s. Uh, I think it's 1994, but I can be, can be either earlier with her, Harvey Pagel. And Orsten Gulenbeck actually starts also in 1994 with the work of Thomas, Thomas Hansen and Amelia Mann. And of course, there's now more modern methods that can do not only one strength uh, of selection, but a ha we call them multi-peak OU, meaning that at different parts of the tree and different uh, subplates, we can have a different dynamics. And the strength of selection, or actually this pool, so backwards to the mean, is different. And those are called, I'm going to put it in another color, uh, multi-peak OU, OK? So in red base, the ones we can do right now are this, uh, Brownian motions and Austin Newlandbeck. And I think these are being developed, but not quite there yet, and they are very complex. Um, but if anyone is interested in that, there's also art tools for that. Now, the world that I live is this beautiful world um, that is the discrete, the discrete um, trait evolution. As I said, I love chromosome numbers, so I work a lot with them, but I also work with other traits that are definitely this great like breeding systems and um, in sexual systems in plants, right? Where would you have hermaphroditism or you have andromonoesy or gyno, uh, gynodiresi. And what you want there is um, a number that can characterize those traits. And for the discrete trait, people pretty early on figure out that you can use your Markov models, the same ones that you've, you've been using for substitution models like Duke Scanter and um, GTR Gamma, right? So these are called the MKN models in which you have a, a Q matrix that you've been studying, like those substitution matrix, if you remember when you have A, C, G, T and A, C, G, T and then you put rates of evolution between pyrimidines or purines, um, transitions or transversions. So you can imagine you can do exact same thing, but instead of having ACGT, you have numbers here, one, two, one, two, and, and, and then you can say, okay, this trade evolved from one to two, for example, from selfing to outcrossing, right? with a rate that we're gonna denote as Q12, and then evolve out of outcrossing back to selfing with a rate Q21, and they don't have to be symmetrical, they just have to be um, something else. And these models, for example, this simple one I started also with Harvey Cagle in the 90s. Mm -hmm. So since the 90s, Nothing, and I'm not right here, nothing had happened to this, nothing. Uh, and when I see nothing, the largest models we've seen there perhaps were models um, for cotton or amino acid evolution in which amino acids, probably these matrices were 20 by 20, how you evolve from one amino acid to the next, but they had been stuck, right? So it is really um, till 2010, and I'm gonna put it here really nicely, um, 2010, that uh, Itai Mayrose 
space and I'll propose this new way. Well, this MKN actually is not a new way, but it's an MKN for chromosome number. And this new matrix was exploded to be not only 20 by 20, like the majority of matrices, it could be from one to all the way to a maximum. And the maximum I think in their matrix was like 50 or 60, okay? So 60 times 60 matrix. So imagine the size of this thing, right? 100, yeah, so it's, it's 3,600 3, entries here in which chromosomes can evolve one way or the other. And this was to understand chromosome number evolution across biology. So from the 90s or mid 90s, all the way to 2010, really nothing major had happened to discrete traits in discrete trait evolution. But prevalent uh, with the problem of size and how many states and how many numbers you can have in that matrix, there was um, another problem, and this is also a very, very important paper by um, Wayne Madison in 2006, which he told us that ancestral state reconstruction is wrong without considering diversification. And this was a radical change um, in ideas, a radical shift. So when we're doing ancestral reconstruction with, with, with these models, we were assuming that the tree was fixed, the tree topology was fixed, okay? And that the trait was really just evolving on top of it without contributing to the diversification process. But the reality is that perhaps, you know, we have a state that was zero, and I'm gonna paint it here in black, right? And it has a diversification process in which one of the lineages went extinct And the other lineage actually survived. And imagine this guy descends from a white, right? So there was a transition here from state one to state zero and then to state zero. And all of a sudden, right, this diversified and had a little offspring that went extinct versus the other one that's so okay. So in reality, in a reconstructed tree, what you will be seeing is this extinction not appearing and simply a transition from one to zero that never, ever, ever consider this extinction, this extinction. And that's a radical change in the way we think about ancestral reconstructions, right? Because in this case, we will be perhaps over or underestimating the number of transitions and really not targeting um, our rates correctly. And I think this paper really opened our minds to think that diversification methods are super important and that we need, when we're reconstructing the, the past, we really need to think about extinction and speciation, um, not only on the change of the, of the transition. So as a solution to this, 
one year after this Miru Sarovo paper comes the very beautiful paper, 2011, of, um, no, actually uh, one year after Madison's paper comes Madison uh, meet for an auto paper with the binary state and speciation, speciation and extinction model. So this, this is the most famous model that we have in terms of diversification and discrete traits. And the tutorial that I'm gonna share with you um, in the next video is gonna focus exactly on this, right? Since this paper, there was, I could say there was an explosion in timeline, so uh, on diversification models, from 27 BC. Then in this timeline, um, a, a myriad of other similar models that start appearing, like GOC for ge uh, biogeography with diversification. In 2000, I put I put the name here, but I should have put the year. So let me redo it. Mm -hmm. GOC. Uh, oh, I did the same mistake. Okay, 2000. I hope you understand, it's late at night. Uh, in 2010, then two rebuttals, but one of very important one saying uh, SSC BC, BC not great. <laughs> and this is, um, but Emma Gober and Dan Gabowski has lots of problems. And this is also 2010. And then a solution to not that greatness on BC, that is the hidden states. Um, this is by Jeremy Bellew and Brian O'Meara in 2016. And then millions of papers with hidden states or um, semi parametric methods like this. So you can see that truly, you know, the focus on discrete trait evolution and how to do it correctly, it starts happening in 2007. So it's been only 13 years of development. Um, and also development, the development, for example, without diversification for ontological traits really started two years ago with a paper by Sergei Carasa. So it's a completely whole new field and people are dipping their toe in there and there's a lot of misconceptions on how to interpret these results, how to actually use the software and how to actually interpret the results. I often review papers where um, people really couldn't grasp what was happening in terms of the speciation and extinction. So it's completely understandable and completely understandable if you have been trying to do this ever. So more about that very soon. All right, um, next video will be on the actual um, BC model.